Great. So welcome to our Think Outside the Sadaka Rock Camp Lamps 2014 Summer Educator Webinar Training. Here's what we're going to be accomplishing in today's training. We're going to talk about a timeline for your teen foundation at your summer camp, some important steps for you as a summer educator to take care of before, during, and after the summer ends. Um, we're going to talk about what a teen foundation does and how it fits within the summer camp study. We are going to overview the program guide, uh, which is the materials that you'll be using to lead this program with your campers. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the basics of grant making, identifying nonprofit organizations, sending out requests for proposals, reviewing grant proposals, going on site visits, and building consensus with your teams. Um, again, if you have questions during this call, you can feel free to jump in or chat us in the corner. Um, and we're really excited to move forward, especially because we have a mix of new and returning summer educators. Some of this information may be familiar to some of you, and some of it will be very new. Um, so feel free to ask questions as we go along. We're going to talk a little bit now on this slide and the next two slides about a suggested timeline for your camp. Um, keep in mind that some of the months may vary with the timing of your camp depending exactly on when your staff arrives and when your campers arrive and when the Teen Foundation is going to be facilitated. In this month in May, um, some of the steps for you, the summer educator, are to attend this training, which you are all doing right now, so bravo. Um, that item is required by second year camps that are receiving funding from JTFN. And as I look across our list of camps today, that is all of the camps represented here. Um, so you, after this training, the next big step will be if you haven't already started thinking about this, to finalize the Team Foundation schedule within the camp calendar. We're going to talk more about that and some of the best ways to do that during this training. Um, reaching out to and identifying five or six local nonprofit organizations and distributing a request for proposal. Again, we'll cover more specifics about that later on. Um, securing at least three grant proposals back from the nonprofit you solicited. Um, and then it's also in May, JTFN will distribute national and international Jewish grant proposals. We'll talk a lot more about that. In June and July, typically during camp, it's very important that summer educators train other summer staff at your camp on this program. Not everyone is going to have this training to go off of, and if there are some other counselors, other educational staff, other programming staff involved in your camp in the Teen Foundation. It's part of your job to teach them this information. We're going to provide resources and a copy of this PowerPoint after this training for you to share. Then you, your campers will arrive and you'll start to lead the Teen Foundation. Uh, you're going to confirm at least two site visits to local nonprofits. And you're going to have your first consultation with the JTFN staff, with Naomi or, or I. In July, or as the summer continues on, the summer educator will work with your camp administrator to arrange transportation for site visits. You're going to take those teams on the site visits. And you're going to, you or one of the campers are going to write a blog post or a newsletter article, a second consultation with the JTFN staff, and then at the end of the summer, uh, the teams are going to decide where to award those grants. As the sum after the decision has been made, the summer educator should inform all nonprofits, all no nonprofits that were contacted, all nonprofits that had a site visit, whether they did or did not receive the grant from your camp. Um, you're going to, and your administrator are going to issue those grant check one or more than one to the nonprofit. Um, you're going to make sure that you submit copies of checks to JTFN uh, before those are sent off. And you're the administrator often at your camp will be handling a lot of the financial ends of this. And then after the summer, uh, at some point, we'll schedule a phone call with you to debrief the program. Um, before I take a couple of questions, I really again want to highlight. Something I said back in, in the piece on June, 
in, in training other staff because this is a really important part that we've learned from the past summer that they can really impact your, um, your camp experience with this program. The other thing I want to make sure is clear is that as you hopefully know, all of the camps have been designated one of the senior professionals on your camp, full-time staff, to be what we call the administrator. It's often a camp director a camp or a camp assistant director of your camp. Um, and they've been already in touch with us to sort of see this program from their viewpoint and dealing mostly with the financial aspects and getting the schedule um, and issuing the grant. So if you don't know who the administrator of your camp is, um, I'd be happy to tell you and you can sort of send that in the chat to us. Um, I know this was a very quick timeline overview and you'll get a copy of this timeline to help you after camp, or I'm sorry, after this training session. Um, and I know that some things we're going to cover moving forward, but right now does anyone have any immediate questions? I'm going to take that as a no. If anything comes up as you're thinking about these things, um, you can, like I said, interrupt us or let us know through the chat that you have a question. So before we jump in, um, to more about what you're going to be doing with your teams this summer, I want to take a moment to share some really encouraging statistics from last summer's evaluation that really get to the core of why we do this work. Um, I also want to say a big thank you. As we heard, a couple of you have participated last summer, so thank you for um, making these evaluations possible by filling out the, those forms yourself and having your teams do so. So I'm just going to, you can, you can see what's the um, points that are on the screen, I'm just going to highlight two of them. So we heard last summer that 79% of staff and 90% of camp directors felt that the program had a positive impact on the overall camp experience, and that 81% of campers felt that the program increased their connection to their Jewish values, such as tikkun olam, tzedakah, and philanthropy. So those are some of the reasons that we're doing this work. And we, again, thank you for being partners in it. So what does the Team Foundation do? While this might be a review for some of you, it's still an important reminder to review what our goals are here. So um, a Team Foundation is a group of 12 to 25 campers that come together for 15 to 20 program hours to begin to explore their Jewish values. They understand the similarities and differences between Sadaka and philanthropy. They learn how to work as a group and to make decisions using consensus building. They create a mission statement to guide uh, their giving away of money or grant making. They review at least three proposals from nonprofit organizations. They conduct two site visits to local nonprofits. They, then they make a decision using consensus building on where to give their money, their pool of money to. And lastly, they share and celebrate that decision with the rest of camp. So we have broken this process into eight steps, as some of you probably remember. So just remember eight. It's like the magic number for this program. Now, we're, we want to talk a little bit about what a Teen Foundation can accomplish. So first, we. I'm sorry. Um, so GTFM works with 133 Jewish teen philanthropy programs throughout North America. And we see teen foundations, which teach teens about, again, grant making or the giving of money, as a tool for engaging teens in exploring Jewish values and what it means to be part of a Jewish community. So the goals of running a teen foundation are to teach basic philanthropic principles and giving based on Jewish values, to provide a forum to explore personal values around giving, to develop team leadership and teamwork skills, to teach group decision making, and lastly, to create a culture of giving at your camp. So we've been working with camps for a number of summers, as I mentioned. I've been doing so for three summers, and we had an um, initiative that predated that since 2007 that worked with some of the Ramah camps. And through these experiences, we've learned that Jewish teen philanthropy has a three-pronged impact at summer camp. It not only impacts the teens who were our original target group, but it also impacts staff. That's many of you and those staff, other staff members you'll be working with in your divisions and groups this summer who can learn a great deal as facilitators of this program. And 
also the camp as a whole in developing a culture of giving at your camp. So um, that gave you a, an overview of what a Team Foundation is and does and the main goals. Before we move ahead into some of the specifics, I just again want to pause for questions. All right, we're going to keep on going. So as I mentioned before, eight is the magic number for this program. You can see um, in front of you that the program guide helps you as a summer educator lead this process over eight tasks. Each task has a cover sheet which leaves out the learning goals for the task and then offers three to four full like curricular activities that you can use to meet those learning goals. So I recommend that you review the activities in order to decide which works best for your camp, taking into account the age of your campers and the specific culture of your camp. And you're welcome, of course, to pull pieces from other activities or to create your own activities based on those learning goals or to use other activities that are on our website, which we'll actually get to in a minute. So um, as you can see, Andrew posted um, the link to get, to, to get that whole program guide in the um, chat box. And I'll just talk us through um, the task because that really also lays out the entire program arc. So first, we cover introduction and values clarification. Next, understanding Sadaka. The third task is building consensus, where the teams get an understanding of what consensus building is. The fourth task is defining mission, which will help them to guide their giving as a group. Task five is grant proposals, so it's reviewing proposals and learning about grant proposals. Task six is site visits, which we'll highlight again later on, but is often um, you know, the highlight of the program for many teams. Task seven is, make, is the grant making decision, which again uses consensus building, which we've already taught in an earlier task because you know, we're building upon different ele elements in order to culminate in that final decision. And lastly is celebration and sharing, um, which allows your teams to sum up that experience and hopefully share it with others in your camp. So um, actually new this summer is the fact that we have a, what, what I think is a really robust um, new uh, website that uh, launched uh, following the CAMP program last summer and which uh, you can thank Andrew for a lot of hard work on. And so um, the program guide can be downloaded from our website. Um, again, you've, you've gotten the link and you can see it on the screen. Um, in the black box uh, is a screenshot from the web page where you can download the materials from. And um, you can choose either to download that full program guide from the first link or to download it as pieces, um, however you prefer to work. And um, just to highlight that, there are also three appendices on that page. They include a sample request for proposal, which is going to be probably the first thing that you want to make sure to download. I'd say along with the introduction, especially if this is your first time running this program, I suggest you read the introduction um, you know, directly following this call. Um, next, uh, also as one of the appendices, is a sample grant acceptance and denial letters to be sent to nonprofits. So uh, we'll go back. We'll come back to that later. But another important piece you need, and lastly, is a vocabulary of nonprofit terms that you may just want to review, um, but didn't fit directly into any of these tasks. Um, as I mentioned on DTFN.org, you will find many other resources. So if you head to uh, oh sorry, many other resources from many different programs. But if you head to um, jtfenorg resources camp which is also up on your screen. Um, you'll find materials created by other camps. Um, so some of the camps in the past have taken this program guide that we provided and um, uh, you know, built out some elements more than others and have given those materials back to us. And so we're sharing them with you. So if one of the activities that fit the task in the program guide don't feel like they fit exactly for your camp, that's the next place that you can look. 
And uh, we also hope that you will all help develop new materials this summer and contribute to that page. Um, as you can see, our website is all about sharing program materials from different programs with each other. Um, so if you create anything this summer, please do send it to us. Um, lastly, I just want to mention that um, we, we sometimes hear from camps that Internet access is not dependable at camp, um, or there aren't a lot of computers where you can access Internet. So I would recommend that you download all of these materials and have them on your computer, um, assuming many of us use our laptops at camp, before the summer begins, or perhaps if that's your style, you even want to print them out. Um, that way you are sure to have them when you need them, even if the Internet is down, as we know can happen. Great. Thank you, Naomi. Um, we're going to move ahead. We're moving pretty quickly, which is great. And we're going to actually spend a little bit of time talking about you as the summer educator of this program. Um, so on the screen you should see represented yourself by one of three smiley yellow faces. Um, in this triple Venn diagram you see sort of the three skill sets that we believe will help you successfully run your Teen Foundation this summer. Those three skill sets being A, a knowledge of Jewish texts and values, B, facilitation skills with groups of teens, and C, understanding of grant making and nonprofits. In, this, in a second we're going to do a poll, so be ready for that, um, on these three areas. So if you're looking at, at these three things and thinking sort of to yourself, um, if there's an area you feel like you're really strong in, that's great. And you should continue to bring your best foot in that area. Uh, if there's one of these three areas you feel you're not so strong on, um, one option is for you to work with us and we can help you identify some ways to get stronger on that. Another area is to think about having a guest facilitator join the group specifically on the topics of Jewish text or on grant making. To come and teach the teams, we've seen several camps use this model um, and have told us it's been very successful. They've had someone come in for one or two of the sessions to do sort of a guest teach. So we're going to do a poll where you sort of think anonymously uh, a self-assessment of where you think you are in these three areas. We won't see who says what, so please answer honestly, and you can select all that you that apply. Uh, a, you know, strong in Jewish text and values. B, strong in still playing with teens. C, strong in grammar and non-profits. Or if you don't feel you're strong in any of these, you can select that first one. So feel free to fill out the poll now. Again, this is anonymous, and we won't see who answers what. Okay. Give it a, another minute. Actually, another 15 seconds. Are you, is everyone seeing the poll on the screen? Yep. Okay. Great. So. Oh, I guess these are showing percentages. That's okay. Um, it seems like we have most people feeling very confident in their ability to facilitate with teens, which is great. Um, secondly, um, a strength in understanding and using Jewish texts and Jewish values with teens. And, and some of you felt a strength in grant making and nonprofit, but it seems like some people will see that as an area that they can work on. Um, great. This is actually a very common breakdown when we sort of talk to our summer educators about these exact areas. Um, in fact, this is almost always the result similarly. Uh, so very normal. And for those of you indicating that you want improvement in a certain area, um, but then in that area it's really important to spend extra time preparing with those materials. Um, as you, um, you know, look back, we have these eight tasks broken up into eight specific areas. And if you feel you need more work on the grant making side, um, and the, maybe consensus is an area specific that you want to work more in, um, or understanding nonprofits, then make sure you're extra prepared for that 
task in that session ahead of time. Um, we also have additional resources that we can point you to. You can always email us and let us know. Or we can set up one of your first consultations on a specific topic and, and work with you to develop in an area you need so you feel confident in all areas. So thanks everybody for participating. Um, we're now going to spend some time talking about how to schedule your team foundation within your summer camp. Um, in our experience over the past few years, as we've worked with camps, uh, we've learned that about 15 programmatic hours at camp is necessary to cover all these materials adequately and to successfully run this program and successfully award these grants. Um, and that might seem like a lot of time at your summer camp um, between all the other activities going on and the teams have to um, play, they play sports, they go swimming, they take showers, they eat meals. So camp is a very busy time. Um, and 15 program hours may seem like a lot, but the beauty of the program is that you can allocate those 15 hours in whatever way works best for you. Um, we also sort of recommend that the 15 hours are real programming and don't really include the transportation to and from your site visit. So you have to sort of add those hours on top of the 15. Um, but again, breaking it up in a way that feels right for your camp. Some of you did this last year and I know are continuing the same schedule. Some of them are some camps are sort of shifting the schedule, um, but we've seen everything work from camp to camp. Some camps group it into two or three long seminar days. Some camps meet every day. Some camps um, meet two to four times a week. Some of them meet once a week for a longer period of time, and some camps do a combination of all three. So we're actually going to um, take another poll, pretty quick, about how you're going to break down the 15 hours in your camp. Um, we're going to, again, select just one of these options. Um, is it going to be a long seminar day, daily meetings? You're going to meet two to four times. Um, a combination of these, weekly meetings, a combination of these, or you're not actually sure at this point. So we'll give it a, another 15, 20 seconds. You go ahead and share in the poll. And it seems as as we can see on the screen, seems like everyone's finished. A, a combination of these is sort of the most common. Um, some one camp is going to do weekly meetings, and um, most people are unsure. Or some people are unsure, 33%. Um, so I'd love to actually hear from a couple people about their scheduling and how they're going to integrate this in the summer. I'm actually going to call on uh, Noam first. Noam, can you sort of share how your camp schedules this, both what you did last summer and what you're thinking for this upcoming summer? Hi. Yeah. Um, I actually put a combination of these, but on second thought I should have put meet two to four times a week, and that's because mm -hmm. in theory, basically it goes um, during the time when all the campers have their hug, their daily activity, that's what we call it. Um, and in theory, it is daily, but we actually at Billowim have so many theme days and so many special things going on that this theoretically daily activity only happens about 15 to 16 times during the entire two months. Mm -hmm. um, so it ends up being about two to four times a week. Great. And that's one quick question. How long is the session for? How many minutes or hours was it? It's a full hour. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, yep. <laughs> uh, I'd love to hear from a couple other people. Perhaps also, Shai, could you sort of share about what you're thinking and maybe how you compare it to last summer? And you led this program last summer at Yavna. Yeah, um, last summer we we did weekly meetings. Um, the the age groups have a, that we're doing with have a lot more unstructured time to fit in, and so we just once once a week. We usually did like probably two hours or so, once two and a half maybe once a week, um, and it seemed to work well. We had like a nice break in the middle of the two hours, so like what's been going on for too long, 
team like that, and it was easy to schedule only one time rather than have to fit in multiple days and figure that out. So I think my, the plan is to continue doing it the same way and, and make one block of time a week that you just do what you need to do. Um, just because of scheduling, things get so complicated with who's where during what day and things like that. So for us, Ayamna, it was definitely easier to schedule it for one time than to have to deal with scheduling multiple times for a week. Great. Thank you. Do we have maybe one more person who wants to share how they're going to schedule their team foundation at their camp? Well, I know that a couple of people listed um, that they're still unsure and they're figuring it out. And one really important note that I will emphasize is we've heard from camps over the years that if it's not scheduled, if the 15 hours, however you schedule them, are not scheduled going into the summer, going into when the teams arrive, it's very challenging to rush this program in the last three days of camp. And they found that um, they've had to cancel some activities to really get the teens uh, to put the time in to, to sort of complete the grant making process and canceling activities is no fun for anyone. And rearranging schedule last minute is, can also be unpleasant. So we found and we've heard on several occasions that it's very important to schedule this out before the summer begins so that you have ample time to complete this process. We really encourage for you who are figuring out your schedule to work with your camp director and work with your administrator, work with whoever the person you need to work with to figure this out before, ideally before staff orientation starts, but definitely before those campers come onto camp. So you're sure that you have enough hours to get everything done. So now that we've gone through a understanding of what a team foundation does and what it aims to accomplish. Um, you can start putting the pieces together. Um, on the screen now you'll see a list of key questions to consider. These aren't questions to be addressed right now during this training. Um, but these are a good list worth thinking about before the summer begins. Um, again, how many teams are in my group? Do I need to run multiple groups? How much money will my teams have to give away if I do multiple groups? How can I inform and prepare other staff at my camp? We sort of uh, we talked about this earlier. Um, this is a really key point that I'm going to pause on because if there are other staff that are going to be heavily involved, we recommend providing a short explanation or an orientation to what the team foundation is and how as fellow staff they can be helpful. This is a great thing to include during staff orientation week. So Talk to your camp director and director about scheduling a half hour or an hour during staff week to meet with the unit or division or the right staff group to go over this information. Um, well, and I said we'll provide a copy of these slides after, which you can share with those other camp staff. Um, but that third and fourth question on your screen, how can I inform and prepare other staff and who will be involved, is um, really key. Another key point is. Number five, when and where the teams will meet. Sometimes teams have had sort of space challenges, finding a, an appropriate space to meet. Um, specifically as it gets hot in the summer, meeting outdoors can be challenging. Um, and as, um, as Noel said, and as oh, Shai said that when they meet for two hours, they give the teams a break and they'll thinking about the attention span of your team and thinking about um, how long can a session go before the team needs to press on to the next thing, scheduling timing-wise, location-wise at your camp. And number six, um, when will I schedule my site visits? What are times that I can take my campers off camp for this program? What else is going on on camp? How can I work with my director to make sure that we are leaving at the right time? So this slide, again, will be a good one for you to refer back to when we distribute these slides to you following this training. And if there are any questions, feel free to um, say, uh, feel free to always chat them in the chat box. Um, one thing I'm going to ask 
quickly of the group. So if you if this if you have any answers, please share. Um, how many of you are thinking right now of having multiple cohorts? Um, you know, this can be a difficult question. How will I know if I need to? Um, Naomi, do you want to touch on this? Sure. Um, I just was thinking about how we made a recommendation earlier on that you need to have that each group, of, each team foundation is twenty to twenty. It's twelve. I'm sorry. I think we said twelve to twenty-five. Um, once you get bigger than twenty-five, it's really going to be unwieldy. So if you are working with a much bigger group, um, you should just spend some time thinking about how you're going to. Um, separate the teens so that they can each have a smaller group that they make those decisions with and go through the process with. So for example, if I were, if I had a group of 50 teens, I would run the, each of these sessions concurrently, um, but 25 of them would make, make the grant making decision together and the other 25 would make their grant making decision together. And that would also impact the fact that if I have $1,000 to give away, each of them may only be uh, in control of what happens with $500 of, dollars of those dollars, but collectively as a division or as a camp, they would still be giving away $1,000 so they could still feel that impact. Um, so. You know, I don't know if most of you are working with bigger groups or smaller groups, um, but I want—I just want to make sure that's clear. Um, can anyone just speak to um, having more than one cohort? Is there anyone working with more than one cohort? I think in theory we might be doing it again with two different ones. Who's that? Um, I'm shy. Great. Okay. Yeah. Um, so last summer we had two, and I think we're doing it again this summer. Great. So you have more than um, more than 25 kids in your group. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Great. Are there any other questions about that? Andrew, did you have anything else to say on this? No. That was that's great. Thanks. Okay. So um, as we saw before, um, when we did our little self-assessment. Um, there is a sense that, in general, most of us feel more confident about the, um, you know, Jewish education pieces and the teen facilitation pieces than the grant making piece. So, on top of being able to access Andrew and I, and you know, focusing in on those pieces, we're going to cover that. We're going to focus in on that here. Um, so, I want to be clear with that. First of all, that when we talk about philanthropy in this program, we mean the giving of grants and the giving of money, um, n not fundraising. Um, but that can also be included, um, you know, in some contexts. So when we're covering grant making, we're talking about identifying nonprofit organizations, sending out requests for proposals, reviewing grant proposals, going on site visits and building consensus in order to make a grant making decision. So uh, just to zero in on this topic, I want to ask again for a type of self-assessment. Again, we don't know who answers what on these questions. We just get percentages. Um, so what experience do each of you have with grant making? Um, and I'll just let you have a minute to fill out the poll that's on the screen now. All right, I think everyone has answered. Oops, it's still changing. Um, so it looks like, you know, as we know, we have a couple of people who have facilitated Team Foundation before as part of this program. Um, and some of you have also, you know, about half of you have also been involved in writing for or applying for a grant. Um, or I think maybe even being in a Team Foundation yourself. So, um, so great. So there is varied experience in the group um, with what we consider grant making. So if you haven't done so already, your next step, and the first step for many of you after this webinar, is to contact local nonprofits. Um, 
a good rule of thumb is to start contacting nonprofits a month before you arrive at camp. You, this means that you'll need to create a request for proposals and send it out. So you can use our sample in the program guide or update the one your camp sent last summer. Again, I highlighted that you could find it on that page where you can download all the materials. Um, JTSN requires that your team foundation review at least three grant proposals from local nonprofits and conduct two site visits during the summer. And this is in order to to have a full experience, they need to be able to consider a range of nonprofits um, to compare them in strengths and weaknesses um, and how they fit with their stated um, mission statement, with the team's stated mission statement. So you, um, so where should you look for these? First, I recommend using the connections of your camp. So those of you who, who ran this program before and who are working with a group of campers this summer, um, I encourage you to go back to the same nonprofits if you had a good experience with them, obviously. Um, and also, some of your camps may be involved with nonprofits in the area for other types of service projects, so that's a great place to go as well, um, someone that knows your camp. I also encourage you to ask the other staff members, especially anyone that lives locally, um, your director and your board for any connections to local nonprofits. Um, use your own personal connections also. Um, and you can also um, consider looking into the local Federation, Jewish Federation um, and other local teen philanthropy programs. Um, so JTFN has connections with some of these federations, um, and I can especially give you um, contact information for any local for any local federations or foundations that run teen philanthropy programs not far from your camp. So some of you have already been connected with those, and obviously there aren't um, connections in every area, but you can go to the URL that's on the screen, which Andrew will type into the box now, to see the, the full list of DTFN um, Jewish teen philanthropy programs around the country, and they may be able to connect you to nonprofits that are in your area. So, um, so these are all the the places to look to find those nonprofits. Um, the next question is what to look for. So location is important um, because as we mentioned, site visits are required, at least two site visits. So your teams may choose to, you or you may choose to present your teams with a number of grant proposals. I would suggest no more than eight um, and, and probably looking for a target of three to six. Um, and but two of those, at least two of those nonprofits need to be local to your camp such that the teens could actually visit them. Um, so location is important. Um, second, the organizations have to be willing to have your teens come on site visits. So uh, when you reach out to the nonprofit, it's important that you make sure that um, they're going to be willing to have you there or they have the capacity for that. Um, and last, we should of course, keep be aware of teens' interests. So um, you may have, I'm, I'm sure many of you have worked with teens in the past, which may just give you a sense of what kind of organizations would interest your teens. Um, JTFN also has some information nationally about what ha about the types of organizations that our teen foundations have given to before. Um, and here you go. So the top five popular issue areas for teen foundations um, based on where they actually gave their money, um, based on survey results from, from, two, from the 2012-2013 year when we asked the 85 teen foundations um, that we were connected with to tell us where their teens gave their grants. What we heard was that youth and children was the most popular, education the next, um, so again, both of those really address um, young people. So teens often like to give to other young people. Um, poverty, or looking at really basic needs. Jewish identity and special needs. Um, so these were in the list. So again, when you're, when you're thinking about nonprofits and nonprofits in your area, if you have choice, these may be ways to go. Um, great. So, an RFP asks a nonprofit to apply for a grant, explains any eligibility requirements, and um, asks them to 
to complete a grant proposal. So we recommend that when you reach out to a nonprofit, you provide an introductory letter which explains who you are. Um, include any guidelines, so that would be how much money they can apply for, um, you know, the, the necessity of being available for site visits, um, any deadlines such as when the deadline is due and when you'll let them know if they'll receive their application, if they're, when you will let them know whether or not they've received funds, um, and of course your contact information or whoever is the, the contact person for your camp. So we, as we mentioned, are, provide um, a sample RFP that's in the appendix of the program guide. Um, so but I would recommend that because you are not a well-known foundation, or none of you are yet, um, I encourage that you reach out personally to the organization um, that you would like the team to consider and, and speak with them directly to explain the program um, and see if they would be willing, if they'd be able to meet those criteria before you send them the RFP. Um, it's important that you're clear in that conversation that you will need them to actually complete a short grant proposal and that they'll be available for site visits. We've heard over the years that some of you are concerned about finding nonprofits who are willing to apply to, um, to who are willing to apply for relatively small grants. But on the whole, we've heard from team philanthropy programs and from most camps that um, they've been able to find nonprofits that are excited about talking to teens and interested in having them learn about their organization, even if it is for small dollars, um, and therefore happy to work with you. Um, you may also consider ways to leverage this, you know, you might tell the organization that you're going to let all the parents of that age group know wh which organizations the teens considered for grants, or that uh, if you have another camp in your area, you could both look at the same nonprofits. So th those are a couple ways to leverage this experience, but again, we've not heard much concern with having trouble finding organizations to apply. Um, as I mentioned, the sample RFP, which is in the appendix, um, you'll see that it's quite short and it will not take nonprofits a long time to fill out. Um, so that, isn't, that shouldn't be one of your concerns. Um, just make sure that you review it carefully because it has a number of spots where it asks you to fill in re information that's relevant to your camp. So before we move ahead, are there any questions about the request for proposals or finding organizations? All right. Great. Andrew's going to tell you about a new opportunity this year. Yes. Thank you, Naomi. Um, for those we worked with before or not up until now, many of the things we've covered have been review or the same programmatic components from last year. But now we're going to take um, a moment to talk about an exciting new opportunity for this summer. So um, we're going to be providing you, as in uh, each camp, both you and your director, with three grant proposals that we at JJFN have worked with um, from national and international Jewish nonprofits. Um, these are larger Jewish organizations that serve a variety of communities. Um, and these are in addition to the local nonprofit grant proposals that you are going to solicit and receive back. Two site visits are still required by your camp, two off-site site visits um, to local nonprofits in your area. Um, but we're adding these three national and international Jewish nonprofit grant proposals into the mix. Um, if your teens and your mission statement of your teen foundation align with one of these Jewish national or international nonprofits, um, and, you, and your teams are very interested in giving their grant to this organization, um, then there's going to be some sort of interaction in the form of a Skype call or a, or a phone call with a designated staff person at those organizations. So we've been working with a specific staff member, and if your teams want to pursue this route, you're going to be in charge of contacting that person to set up this phone call or Skype visit with some of your teams in the team foundation or all of your teams in the team foundation, depending on 
um, the timing of your team foundation and the timing of that designated staff person. Some of you might be thinking, um, why and uh, why add these in? And we found that um, these new national and international Jewish nonprofits are going to prompt new conversations that weren't happening at a lot of camps. First, a conversation about whether they should fund Jewish versus non-sectarian or non-Jewish, non-religious organizations. We heard from many camps last summer that this really important conversation didn't happen because there were no Jewish nonprofits near your camp, and therefore that wasn't an option for your camp to give to a Jewish organization. We think this is a really key conversation that we want all of the teams in all of our camp programs to be having. So this, these new grant proposals should prompt that. The second new conversation is about giving locally versus giving nationally or even internationally. Uh, asking your teams where, um, you know, where do we think our efforts are best put? Should we t focus on our local community? Should we focus on our world? Um, this is another conversation we believe is really important that we want you to have with your team. Um, I'm going to briefly mention the organizations we're going to be working with. Um, so you're going to soon be receiving grant proposals from these three Jewish organizations. Matan, which is a Jewish um, students with special needs advocacy organization. Innovation Africa, which brings Israeli innovation and technology to African villages. Uh, and Leket Israel, the National Food Bank of Israel. They're located in Israel. This is a new element for this year. Does anybody at this time have any questions on this aspect? Okay, great. Um, just to reiterate, your teams may not go in this direction because your team's mission statement may be, for example, I'm making this up off the top of my head, that we want to fund you know, something here in our local community. So uh, that still could be a Jewish or not Jewish organization, but these three organizations would not be into that mix. Um, so this may or may not come into your, your, your team foundation, but we wanted to give camps this option. Um, great. We're going to take a minute and talk now about site visits. We've heard from a lot of our teens that the site visit is one of the most exciting parts of the Teen Foundation. Um, some of that depends on the culture of your camp and whether the teens leave camp uh, at any other time during the summer or whether this is their only opportunity to be off camp for the entire time they're at camp. Um, but either way, we found it to be a very memorable and powerful experiential learning moment in this program. Um, so you know, by the time you go to the site visit, you already will have reviewed at least three grant proposals. Um, and task five sort of focuses on getting you ready once you've read those grant proposals for the site visit. So uh, preparing with your camp administrator to get everything set up logistically. Um, in that task, you can also hear about ways to prepare the nonprofit. Um, informing them we're bringing a group of teens. Um, they're going to be asking questions sort of, and you know, once the site is confirmed, how to set, prepare that. Again, this is in task five. And then how do you prepare your campers before you get there? Then when you're on a site visit, a typical site visit is typically an hour and includes a, about a 20-minute presentation from the nonprofit where they will give a spiel about what they as an organization do or a specific project that they want to teach you about. It will be an opportunity for the teams to ask questions. So it's very important that your teams are prepared with questions ahead of time. And then it usually ends with a tour of the site of the project of the location of the nonprofit. And they will typically show you around. Uh, if possible, we really encourage you to encourage your teams to dress a little nicer than their average camp clothes uh, on the site visit. This will help them feel more empowered and present themselves more appropriately as funders, as members of the nonprofit philanthropy world. Then just as important as all this is follow-up. Debrief is an essential part of this process, and we want to make sure that you give the teams a chance to discuss their impressions 
pretty soon after the visit, ideally right after the visit, so they can sort of think about their initial impression um, while still in their head, and to also separate that moment from when they're having their grant making conversations and when they're thinking about it. So initial impressions from the site visit are different than when it comes to grant making, what did you think about the site visit? So you may want to ask the site visit to give you some time um, in a room without them so you can do that quick immediate debrief uh, before moving on to your next site visit or getting on the bus to go back to camp. Uh, so that's a very important part. Oh, it's also very important to thank the organization um, for coming. And as I said, teams typically react really well to site visits. Um, an eighth grade camper from York at Crane Lake Camp said that going on site visits was the most meaningful experience uh, because I got to see the operations going on. Seeing something on paper is okay, but seeing it with your own eyes gives you a real wake up call. So again, the importance of site visits and making sure that that is a key part of your team foundation. As we talked about before, one of the learning goals of the program is making decisions through consensus. Consensus is a mutual agreement among members of a group where all legitimate concerns of the individual have been addressed. I want to highlight the importance of your understanding of consensus building before you teach it to teens. Consensus can be tricky to teach and implement without experience. So I would actually challenge you, if you're working with a bigger team on this program this summer, a bigger staff team, to practice using consensus and facilitating making a decision using consensus building among yourselves as staff members so you're prepared to teach it to your teens. Um, not only will this help you facilitate those conversations with your teams better, but it's a great leadership development tool for your staff. So some of you are in a position to be providing those kind of opportunities to younger staff members, um, and this is a great opportunity for that. Um, but remember, both when you're practicing this, hopefully among staff members and when you're doing it with teens, that um, Making a decision in this way is time-consuming work, so be sure to leave lots of time. Sometimes people actually ask me, well, there are eight tasks on 16 hours, so should each one be two hours? Um, generally, going on a few site visits are going to be more than, a, more than one hour each, and consensus building typically needs more than a one-hour block. Um, I would recommend, depending on your group of teens, like at least two hours, um, that you allot to making that decision. Um, so I was, um, you know, once at a at a teen foundation meeting where the teens had just decided where to give their grant, and as the group discussed the process afterward. One teen said that he didn't really care in the end that his favorite organization wasn't chosen because at least he got to tell everyone what he thought. Um, and, and we can see here that from a, from a camper at Camp Kazima last summer um, who said the most personally meaningful part of this whole program was making the decisions. This is because everyone had a chance to add their opinion on the decisions. No one ever felt excluded out of this decision-making process. So why is consensus important? Because the ideas, opinions, and concerns of all group members are heard. So I really encourage you to use this method for decision making. I think you can see from those two anecdotes why it is so valuable to the process. Uh, great. I'm going to spend a second talking about uh, blog posts and social media. Before I do that, um, we've been moving really quickly. I know this call was slated from 4.30 to 6.30 Eastern. Um, we're probably actually going to end closer to 6 o'clock Eastern, 3 o'clock Pacific. Um, so we'll probably be wrapping this up in the next 20 minutes. So I know this has already been a lot of information, but the, the end is in sight. So we're going to continue to talk about the last couple things, take questions, talk about immediate next steps, and we should be done by 6 Eastern. Uh, <laughs> A note, that would so, be really long for those of you on the West Coast. <laughs> yeah. So um, similar to last summer, those camps receiving grants from us, which is all of you guys at second year camps, um, you're going to write at least one, uh, last year was two, but this summer just one, 
um, newsletter article, blog post, email to parents. Now this is an important part of the program. Um, of course, although only one is required, the more the merrier. Um, and posting shorter updates in addition to this on social media, on Facebook and Twitter, is really encouraged because um, we like to sort of share this information out with our year-round school year programs about what the team plan to be seen is at camp. Um, it also doesn't have to be you doing the writing. Campers or other staff can also do the writing of this program. You know, typically if it's a midsummer program that we form this team foundation, we are the our mission statement is X, Y, and Z. We're really excited about our upcoming sizes to blank and blank. Or an end of the summer blog post, we work through this process and we are awarding this amount of dollars to this nonprofit. Um, it's really important that you refer to your team foundation as the name of your camp blank team foundation. So for example, the you are a Camp Kalsman Team Foundation or the Camp Yasmin Team Foundation. We don't want you to call it JTFN. The Jewish Team Funders Network is the network of these programs, and your camp should really own that it's its own team foundation um, on par with all the other year round team foundations that we work with. So um, call it the Camp Yasmin Team Foundation or the Camp Massad Team Foundation as a way to strengthen your own camp identity and work in this area. Um, we also do still encourage you to uh, mention that you are part of a larger program um, receiving funding from the Jewish Team Foundation Network, a national Jewish Team Philanthropy organization. Um, we also have this nice logo for the JTFN Team Philanthropy Program, Club Think Outside the Sabaka Box, uh, which you, uh, you'll be able to download from our website. Um, and if you are interested in samples of blog post from past summers of written by other camps, you can go to the website there, jdfn.org slash camp slash blog, to sort of see how other camps made this happen. Um, and then the, you know, the end of this process is really exciting and what we call task number eight, celebration and sharing. Um, so your campers have made their final decision. You've written some blog posts. Um, you've informed the organizations receiving grants that they're going to be receiving money from your foundation. And the organizations that haven't, you've um, informed as well. Again, as I mentioned, we have sample letters in the appendix for both of the letters for your camp to write. Um, but you know, the real end of the program is celebrating the decision and sharing it with the rest of the camp. This is a really important task, as they all are. Um, it's easy um, to finish the process and be like, great, we're done, moving on. But um, as educators, as you know, it's important to, um, and it is your responsibility to make sure that you don't just move to the next thing and that there's space for recognition and reflecting on this great team foundation on this program. Um, reflection doesn't also have to mean sitting in a circle and sharing one thing you liked about the program and one thing you didn't like about the program. Um, within this task number eight, at the, end of the, at the end of the program guide, there are 18 ways um, that your team can creatively reflect on their experience. You know, utilizing a camp newsletter that goes out to the campers inside for the journalism food or the radio station, um, creating a little sort of fast simulation program for younger campers. Um, lots of resources and suggestions in there for how you go about celebrating the process that these campers went through and sharing this information with the rest of camp. The other thing to think about is as this is a program for the older campers in your camp or even the CITs of your camp, that eventually you're, you want those younger campers to become the campers at that age or those CITs. And this is a great way to showcase something great campers get to do when they become older and get to come back to camp in future summers. Um, also, you know, as we are closing today's webinar, I want to make sure that this piece about being responsible grant maker and following up um, as the summer wraps up uh, is really important. As we are the teachers of teens in this program, um, it's 
critical that um, you demonstrate responsible grant making um, and, like I said, inform the nonprofits about their status. Um, so sending notification letters to all local nonprofits that submitted grant applications, whether or not they even got a site visit, but if they submit a grant, a grant proposal to you, they should get an acceptance or denial letter. And again, these are in the program guide. Um, and you should also be sure to send them in a timely manner and possibly include the teams in writing the language or sending these letters um, or even all of them signing their names on the letter as a way to symbolize that this is really coming from the team. Additionally, as a staff member of your camp, which I know that everyone loves and cares about their camp, and I know everyone feels that their camp is the absolute best, um, because you love your camp so much, it is the reputation of your camp that you need to uphold. Um, we hope that through this program, as we have heard from many of you, that this program helps build relationships between your camp and the local nonprofits and the local community. Um, and it leaves the local community and these organizations feeling really good about your camp and what they're doing for that area, for that community. Um, so really making sure that you uphold proper grant making and follow decisions and be in contact with the nonprofits in a timely manner. Um, and for you, for all the camps here, as you are receiving funding from the Jewish Team Funding Network, um, we're going to work with your administrator, but it's also important for you to know that before you send these checks, to the nonprofits, um, copies need to be made and submitted by uh, by email or hard copy to JTFN so we can go through the proper grant reimbursement. Um, typically, the administrator or the finance person will handle this, but this is important for you just to know as well. Are there any questions on this part? Okay, great. So we're going to um, do final questions in a second, or and I'm going to sort of go around and see what everyone's thinking briefly. But here are the next steps for you immediately following this. Um, the next big step is to work with your administrator to finalize the team foundation schedule within the camp calendar. Um, really thinking about what are the 15 hours going to take place? How often are we going to meet? How um, how are we going to get the teams to develop the 15 hours through this process? Secondly, it's important to think about scheduling time during staff orientation week to inform other key staff about the team foundation and providing them with a copy of these slides that you can go over with them. Uh, and lastly, the next step before summer begins is to identify five or six of those local nonprofits. Then take that request for proposal and craft it to your camp, distribute it to the five or six nonprofits, and secure back at least three grant proposals. So there's a lot to, to go forward for this program between now and when summer starts. And I know that many camps have staff weeks starting in that first week of June. So the time to get going on this is soon. Uh, we're we're going to end pretty quickly. Um, we're going to take final questions now though. If you have a question, feel free to say it aloud or type it in the chat. Um, what are you thinking? What are your concerns? What, what's unclear? What do you want to know more about? Hello, this is Noam from Billowim. Hey Noam, go ahead. Um, last summer I had a lot of I understood on paper and in theory consensus, but I felt like never having actually experienced it myself or like actually seeing it in action, I didn't actually know what it looked like, and so I never actually kind of transferred a proper understanding uh, to my teens as well. So I'm wondering um, if there are any resources you might recommend, especially video resources, where I could actually see like a, a, an example of like a consensus session taking place um, that might help me understand. That's a great question. Now we do want to take this one here. Now we can have our consensus guru. Sure. 
<laughs> I mean, that that is a great question about um, being able to see it. Um, unfortunately, we don't have um, video footage of anyone doing it with the Team Foundation, but I'm going to look at that. Naomi, could you please speak up a little sure, bit? Sure. Sorry. Is this better? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. Um, so I – uh, like what I was saying is that I unfortunately we don't have any video footage of a teen foundation doing any consensus building. I'm going to look around and see if I can find anything online. Um, I think that the camp that the I'm forgetting what task it is offhand, but the task on consensus, um, I think teaching consensus or the decision making one, I, I'd have to look specifically, um, has a number of different activities that you can use. Um, in order to make to to work on making consensus building, and basically the suggestion is you you kind of work through one activity to get to the next level of narrowing down organizations or getting towards the decision, um, and then you may even try another activity. You may need to make, use multiple methods in order to get there. Um, I think that like what I recommended before, that the best way to learn it is actually to practice it with a group of staff. Um, so, for example, you could practice being the facilitator of some people making a decision in that way. Um, but I will look and, and share with the group if we find anything online where you can actually see that. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I think we may, we may have well, – what was that? We'll, I'll, we'll do some research. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, and, you know, I forget, what are you, do you, are you working with other staff members also, or is it just you and the team? I really don't think so. I think I'll be the only staff You'll member. You'll be the only one, okay. So, the, you know, the question would be, could you even think creatively? I don't know what kind of influence you have in, like, the general camp structure, but could we use this as a teaching module because it's a great way to make decisions in an in individual bunk anyway um, that might give you an opportunity to practice it, to, to um, see it in action. That's definitely that an out. interesting okay. idea. Yeah. Great. And no, Naomi and I are actually just looking at a new resource we found um, that I'm going to upload uh, online soon. Um, and store it under our website. I just posted in the chat where you can see the list of all consensus type resources that we've collected in general. Um, so that's so if you go to jtn.org um, resource type slash consensus, you can see a lot more there. Excellent. Thank you. Of course. That was a great question. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? If there are no other questions, I actually have one for the group. This is Naomi. I'm just curious um, to hear your thinking on the national, international nonprofits that we're going to be providing grant proposals for. Um, do you see yourself using those? Um, and how do you how do you imagine fitting them into the other nonprofits that your local nonprofits um, that you're going to? A request proposals for. Can anyone speak to whether you think you'll use those, what conversations you might use them to have? This is Rachel from Calvin. Um, I'm actually really excited to add that component to the debate with my teens. I have the CITs who are, um, most of them are going to be entering um, their first year of college, so I think that they can all handle the um, the discussion. And I'm I'm excited to go over like the differences between doing our um, giving locally and giving um, internationally. And I think it's going to add a really interesting dynamic. Great. We're, we'll be happy to hear a report on how that goes. Thanks, Rachel. Any other comments on those? All right. We'll take one more call. If you guys have any questions um, or anything to share specifically from those who did this last summer, um, please let us know if you have any questions or any things to share.
Okay. Well, it sounds like everyone is still feeling confident and, you know, has some more work to do, but we're really excited to do this work with you. Um, thank you so much for your time. Um, you'll be hearing a lot more from me and Naomi as the next couple of weeks go on. Um, we have your contact information. You should have ours. If not, it's right there on the screen. Um, and we're happy to, as you are putting this together and thinking about those next steps in terms of scheduling, contacting nonprofits, thinking about a staff orientation, teach on this. Um, please be in touch because we have a, um, a lot to work with you on and we're really excited for this to continue at your camps because I know all of your camps uh, who did this last summer had great success and um, I'm really excited to continue doing this work. Naomi, anything else you want to add? No, I think that's it. Um, again, I just want to thank everybody and uh, it'll be exciting to hear how the program goes at each of your camps and uh, again, excited to be involved with, with it. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. So that's it. You can um, um, disconnect from the phone and web. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a good night or Thank afternoon you. for those of you on the West Coast. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thanks.